Good morning, everyone. I want to continue on in our series we've been doing looking at the life of David and asking the question, what, what lessons can we learn from his life, from his example, that we can apply uh, into our own lives? And, and today I, I want to talk about, just in my personal opinion, one of the things that uh, I think he can help us with the most. To get us into this, I want to read a quote I've read uh, many times before in our church. It comes from a, a spirituality writer named A.W. Tozer, a classic book called The Knowledge of the Holy. He writes this, What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of mankind will show that no people has ever risen above its religion. A man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. And so for this reason, he writes, the gravest or the most serious question before the church is always, who is God? And what is God like? And the most, uh, he calls portentous or huge or, or momentous or you know, gigantic fact about any person is not at any given time what he or she may say or do, but what he or she in their heart conceives God to be like. What do they imagine God is like? And then he concludes by saying this, because we tend, as human beings, uh, follow a secret law of the soul, he calls it. We naturally have the tendency to move toward and operate uh, in all of life based on our, our image of God. I remember the first time I heard that quote, I wondered, is that really true? I've been exploring that now for the better part of 30 years. And uh, I just want to say that I really do think it's true. I think that we, uh, what we conceive God is like, what we imagine God is like, it, it, it affects everything about us. Our perceptions of how life is going in the world, our relationship to Him and how we relate to Him, what he, the kinds of things He does or will do, all that stuff is controlled by what we think God is really like. And I think this is one of the most important things that David and his example, his model, can help us with because he had a long and rich history of experiences with God. What did David really think God was like? What, did, what can we learn from David's uh, imaging of God? Well, to jump into that, I just want to kind of remind us of what, a, what an image of God is. My dad wrote this definition down, and I've used it for a long time. An image of God refers to the perception or, or a mental picture of God that we give a descriptive name to or a phrase to that represents it. And this name and phrase, it carries implications about who God is, how God acts, um, how He relates to us, how He relates to the world that we live in. And so it affects everything about our relationship to God. Now, when I, I've, I've done a lot of work on this issue, as you know, I'm, I, I've uh, captured that in a little book called The Reimaging of God. And how an image of God is formed, you know, I've done a lot of research and, and it comes out of the experiences of life. It comes out of our experiences with people. It comes out of all the, the religious input or spiritual input that we've gotten through our lifetimes. And they create perceptions inside of us. And we connect those perceptions usually by forming an association or a mental image uh, of them. And then we assign them to God. We form an image of God. It comes out of our life experience, out of our what we've learned, what we've read in the Bible, what we've people have told us, um, all kinds of things. So if you ask the question about what, what kind of mental picture does David paint for us, about who God is and what God is like. Um, you look right to the Psalms of David. Those are the, we, have, we have clear uh, data from him. He writes down, as I've shared with you already in this series, 73 Psalms carry the name, or given the title of David wrote these Psalms. Two others, the New Testament uh, says that he wrote. Um, so half the Psalms we have, half the Psalms we have in the Bible are uh, written by David. 
And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the Psalms this week, and I, I went through all 75 of them. I read through all 75 in one sitting, and uh, I just began to, to pull and make a list of imaging or, or pictures that David paints about who God is and what God is like. And I just wrote down the ones that caught my attention. I didn't even write them all because I don't know how many there would have been. But just the ones that caught my attention, uh, there were 78 of them. And um, I just started to think about it. If I took 30 seconds to read the text and 30 seconds to describe the image that David is painting for us, the image he's sharing with us, I said that would already be almost an 80-minute sermon. And I thought, huh, how do I cut a very long sermon down into something much more manageable? So here's what I decided to do. I'm going to try to share 20 of the images. I'm not going to teach on the images. I'm not going to reflect on them and tell you about how powerfully they can affect our lives. I'm going to leave a lot of that work uh, for you to do in, in your own uh, kind of time with God. But I do want to illustrate how I read a text and how I get an image from God from it. So we're going to look at a number of these texts and images that come from David. So we're going to start in Psalm 3. Start with an easy one. Psalm 3, verse 3. It says this, O Lord, you are a shield around me. You are my glory. You are the one who holds my head high. So you can see in just that one verse, there's three images. God is a shield around us. God is the source of glory, and he's the source of my glory. But the image I wanted that really caught my eye is God, the one who holds my head high. What does that really mean, holds my head high? Well, he's the one who encourages me. He's the one who strengthens me. He's the one who gives me hope. And in times like what we're going through right now, um, we really need God to reveal himself as the one who holds our heads high, encourages us, strengthens us, gives us hope. Psalm 13, verse 3. Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes, or I will die. This is the New Living Translation. I love it. In the, in the NIV, it says, it says, give light to my eye, or enlighten my eye is another way you could translate it. But I love this, this kind of paraphrasing, interpreting. Give a sparkle, give that spark of life back to my eyes, or I will die. And so I kind of wrote down the image of God as the, the one who restores the sparkle to my eyes, the one who gives life again, lights it all up. And um, that you could just spend a lot of time in that image. Oh Lord, do that. Do that with us right now. I pray for everyone who's listening to this message. Do that. Bring a sparkle back to our eyes. Give us life. Psalm 18. Psalm 18 is one of my favorite psalms, and it's uh, a psalm that's just full of imagery of God. And uh, so I'm just going to read a couple of verses <clears throat> to you, and it uh, says like this in verse 2, The Lord is my rock. He's my fortress. The Lord is my Savior. My God is my rock, in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me in my place of safety. In verse 16, He reached down from heaven and rescued me. He drew me out of the deep waters. Just chock full. David, that's one of the major themes he has when he talks about God and his imaging of God, who God is and what God is like. He's the one who's the rock, the fortress, the refuge, the shield, the one who protects me, the one who rescues me, the one who saves me and um, my place of safety. All these are powerful images that, that deserve to be reflected on. But the one I really like here that I was caught my eye was uh, from verse 16. God, he's the one who pulls me out of the deep waters. You ever just think about that? Pulls me out of the deep water. When, when you're in deep water, you are in trouble. And um, there's nothing else that can help you. You're going you're gonna to try to tread water. You're going to try to swim. You're going to try to not go under. But um, eventually you will without help. You need help. And God is the one who rescues us 
out of the deep waters, the troubles, the problems, the kind of situations we get ourselves into. I love that image. Uh, Psalm 30. You have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You've taken away my clothes of mourning, and you have clothed me with joy. And so another image that I've been thinking about all week long is this. God, you're the one who turns mourning into dancing, grieving, sadness, dismay, despair, all those things that go and belong to mourning. You turn those into dancing. It's hard to dance when you're really down and sad and grieving and the energy is sapped out of you and all those things. And, and here is God. David experienced him as the God who turns mourning into dancing. Not mourning as in the beginning of a day, but mourning in terms of grieving, sadness, despair, depression, loss, all those kind of things. He turns mourning into dancing. And then he takes off all of the stuff that belongs to mourning, the clothes he calls it, and he, in, in its place he brings joy. You know, joy is not happiness. Joy is something much deeper, much more deeply rooted than happiness. And that's what God brings to us. He brings to us joy. Joy instead of mourning. That's an image we're thinking about. And imagining all the different ways God can apply that to our lives. How about Psalm 34? I prayed to the Lord and He answered me. He freed me from all my fears. The eyes of the Lord, as verse 15, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and His ears are open to their cries for help. Verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and the Lord rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Just think about those three images that I just highlighted. God is the one who frees me from all my fears. How many? All. All my fears. That's just glorious to imagine. Not, not a single fear left. God, the one who stays close to the brokenhearted. There's a lot of things that break human hearts. And one of the things that uh, happens when a heart is broken is we feel alone, we feel isolated. And this, this imaging that David shares is God stays close to us. So if you're experiencing a broken heart or evidence of a broken heart, God's very close. Just look. Look around. Find Him. He's there. And then the third image, God, the one who rescues people whose spirits are crushed. You ever had a spirit, your spirit crush? What is that like? It's, it's being so disappointed. It's being so disillusioned. It's being just the loss of hope, the loss of, of everything you were looking forward to or looking for. That's what happens, those kind of things, when a spirit is crushed. And David experienced having his spirit crushed. And what he experienced that was amazing in the context of that is that his God rescued him when his spirit was crushed. And so he, he shares this image with us. God is the one who rescues people whose spirits are crushed. Oh, just, I'd like to live in that for a little while. How many of us have been dealing with broken hearts and crushed spirits? Loss of hope, loss of a lot of things. And uh, God is, wants to meet us. Uh, another, let's go on. Psalm 37. Though they stumble, they will never fall. He's taught that the they as people who are walking with God, following God. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. Psalm 37, 24. The image. I'd love to picture the men. Just try to draw a picture in my mind, my imagination of what this looks like. God, the one who holds our hand that keeps us from stumbling and falling. Have you ever seen someone hold someone, hold someone's hand uh, so that they don't stumble and fall? Often we think of old people who need help. Uh, and, you know, that kind of fits me these days. And I love this idea that in every way, uh, the things that would try to trip me up, the things that would try to make me stumble, the things that would try to make me fall, God wants to be there through all of them, and He wants to hold my hand so that I don't stumble and I don't fall. Psalm 60, 
I love this imagery. Psalm 60, verse 4. But you, he's talking about dealing with a whole bunch of enemies who are after him, trying to kill him. But you, God, David writes, have raised a banner for those who fear you, a rallying point in the face of attack. You know, the image that God, the one who raises a banner, calling all the fighting forces to your side. That's the image that, that David is trying to share. Now, you have to understand battle, and some of the best ways that I can imagine this in my mind is going to, to TVs or movies that have portrayed, you know, when the king is fighting and, it's, and there, there's someone calls out, blows a trumpet, or, or shouts out, raises a banner and says, to the king, to the king, and all the people, all the forces just do whatever they can to get there, to surround the king, to protect the king, to, to fight for the king. And uh, it's, it's always in the most imminent, dangerous parts of the battles. If you just pick your favorite version of that in a movie or in a TV show or whatever. And then imagine God doing that for you and me. When we're in the most imminent, most dangerous situations we're facing, God is the one who raises a banner. He raises the trumpet. He raises a cry and says, and says To Richard! I love that image. I don't know. Uh, anyway. Um, wow. I, I, I want to... I want to finish um, just with one more psalm, but it's a long one and it has a bunch of images in it. And it's because we live in such a beautiful place here in Colorado. I just love this psalm. I, I wanted to share so many of those are very personal, interpersonal connections between God and us. But this one is just about God in nature, God in, 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 in who he is in terms of relating to our world. And I just... I just love to bask in this. So I'm going to read the whole psalm, and then I'm just going to read through the images so you can get a feeling for them. Uh, psalm 65, starting in verse 5, going down to verse 13. You faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds, O God, our Savior. You are the hope of everyone on earth, even those who sail on distant seas. You formed the mountains by your power, and you armed yourself with mighty strength. You quieted the raging oceans uh, with their pounding waves, and you silenced the shouts of the nation, the shouting of the nations. Those who live at the ends of the earth stand in awe of your wonders. From where the sun rises to where it sets, you inspire shouts of joy. You take care of the earth and you water it, making it rich and fertile. You crown the earth with a bountiful harvest, and even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness become a lush pasture, and the hillsides blossom with joy. The meadows are clothed with flocks of sheep, and the valleys are carpeted with grain, and they all shout and sing for joy. Did you catch all those images? Did you catch them all? I mean, there's just so many in there. I'm just, let me read through one that caught my eye. There's, you could go even deeper in this, but God, here's one inch. God, the one who is the hope for every single person on earth. God, the one who can quiet the raging, stormy oceans. God, the one who can silence the shouting of nations. God, the one who inspires shouts of joy. God, the one who takes care of the earth and waters it. Think of it this way. God, the great gardener. God, the one who creates harvests year after year after year. God, the one who grows the grasses to create lush pastures. You know, only a couple hundred yards from our house where we live, there's an open, big open meadow and field that's protected so they're not building houses on it. And uh, I think when those those grasses grow every spring and early summer. It's one of the most beautiful things to look at. It just turns from that brown, wintry color, and it just turns lush. And you know, God does that all over planet Earth, year after year. He's the one who grows 
grasses. God, the one who creates, cares for, and brings out all the wildfires, or wild, wildfires, wild flowers. You know, that it's it, in the text it says, the hillsides blossom with joy. I think one, one of the most glorious things I've ever seen or had the privilege to see in my life, and I've seen it uh, in the Alps in Europe, and I've seen it uh, all over here in Colorado, or when the wild the wild flower season comes hard to get that out today um, when those come it is just fantastic all the different colors all the different patches of them and I, I, do, I remember hiking up in the um, in different places in Colorado and you come around the corner and you just go your mouth drops open just the beauty and and this is just out there God does this and uh and we get to enjoy it those of us that live in places like colorado and i just think of that image god is the one who creates he plants the seeds he designed the flowers he picked the colors he's picked the shapes he cares for them and he brings them out and then the last image out of this is god is the one who causes fields of grain and flocks of sheep to shout and sing for joy isn't that a great image to think about? Have you ever thought about sheep shouting and singing with joy? They do because they know their creator. They know who designed them. They know, they know who is the one that deserves shouts of joy. And uh, I never thought of fields of grain, but I imagine that if they do it, and I've seen this a lot of time, it's so beautiful for those of you that live in big farming areas. Do you know what I'm talking about? When that wind comes over the fields of, say, wheat or the, uh, some of the others, and it just rustles, it just moves, waves go through the grain. I somehow, every time I see that, I just start worshiping. And I think... That's what the grain is doing as well. Shouts of joy. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. Those are just 20 of the images out of the 78 that caught my eye. I wish I could spend time going on and, and, and reflecting on every one of them. Um, can you see why David was such an amazing worshiper of God? He worshiped God because he, he had amazing experiences where God revealed to him through all kinds of different ways, who God was and what God was like. And he captures it in all these songs and shares it with us. And, you know, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to do that. So these images are not just David's pictures or mental images of God. This was inspired by the Holy Spirit, which means that it was good for David and it's good for you and I. And if you want to enrich your, your imaging of God, immerse yourself in the images that come out of these psalms. And, um, and just let, let that imaging of God, who He really is, and what He's really like, grow. Because I think A.W. Tozer's right. I think it is the most important thing about us, because all of life will be centered in and around our imaging of God, which, by the way, is mostly subconscious. It's deep inside us. We have to reflect. We have to think. We have to consider uh, what we really think God is like. And if you need any help trying to work through that process, I'd be happy to help you. Just, just uh, reach out to me, and I'd be happy to do that. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for these images. There's so many other images that I could have shared about, and I'm just trusting that these are the ones you wanted to be shared this week. And we pray that you would deepen our understanding and our insights and our perceptions of who you are and what you're really like, the kind of things you do, and lead us more and more and more into the depths of who you are. And we look forward to that day when we see you as you really are not through these earthly human eyes, but we see you face to face in heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us. Thank you for inspiring David to write all this down for us to help us out. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have a great week, and uh, go deep with God.